23rd Psalm. What an, what an awesome Psalm uh, from the Lord through uh, King David. So if you need a Bible, we got Bibles uh, in the back. Just raise your hand and uh, we'll get you a copy of God's Word. And praise the Lord. And we're going to look at the, uh, the second part of the first verse of Psalms 23.1. Okay? And it begins, the Lord is my shepherd. We looked at that last week. He is my protector. He is my shelter. He is my refuge. And the key word what we looked at last week was security. Everybody needs security in their life. And if the Lord is your shepherd, he is going to keep you secure. Because the shepherd knows how to keep his children secure, his sheep secure. You remember when David was getting ready to fight Goliath and he was talking to King Saul? He said, you know, you're too small. You can't take him on. He said, no. When I was out on the shepherd field, I would, uh, the bear would come, the lion would come, and he didn't back down. He went after them and he protected his sheep. That's the way the Lord is for us. He is our security. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And that word want, letter A, I shall not want, it means I shall not need. I shall lack nothing, the uh, New International Version tells us. I shall not be in want. So if the Lord is my shepherd, we shall not want. Let's look at that first verse. Uh, Philippians 4.19 is on their flow. Uh, it says, My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Jesus Christ. He is the supplier of all of our needs. Now, there are two major ideas here. And the first, according to the Bible, our Heavenly Father is that He is our provider and He is our protector. Who is my shepherd? Who is my shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd. Think about that. It's not some person out there, it's not somebody who's supposed to be in charge. He says the Lord himself, God himself is my shepherd. And we talked about creation last week. The moon and the stars and everything that you see around you. Who created that? God created that. And the God who created that says that he is your shepherd. A personal shepherd. He knows you by name. He calls you by name. That is my shepherd. You know, when you have somebody, uh, a close friend or a parent or somebody that you just know that you know that you know, any problem I have in my life, it's okay because my dad is here or because this person is here. Well, it is Lord God who is our shepherd who watches over us. And so uh, you can't get a better shepherd than God himself. And like little babies, do you know what? They need 100% care and protection. It is a job that goes 24-7. I mean, you know, after nine months of caring and delivering and all the changes, you're ready for a break. No, the job just began. Once you deliver, you know, the baby is going to be uh, crying and doing all those things. Our kids, they would sleep like babies during the day because they knew they had a full night ahead of them. They're going to be staying up and keeping us up, you know, changing the diapers, feeding them. It, it was on and on and on. It never changed. And you can't go, I mean, you could go 24-7 for three years without a break. You can't just say, all right, I'm going to take two days off. I'm going to go and leave them. You can't leave those children. You've got to continually take care of them. And that's what the sheep are like. You know, when God created sheep, think about this. They are the most needy livestock on planet Earth. They cannot survive by themselves. They absolutely need 
a shepherd. Why do you think God created sheep? And why did he say that all we are like sheep? We are the sheep of his pasture. Of all the animals uh, that God has created, he has related us to sheep. The sheep of his pastures. And you, the very first shepherd, by the way, in Genesis, was Abel. From Cain and Abel. Once the fall happened... Immediately, the sheep that used to lie together with the lamb, uh, the lion and the lamb would lie together. Not anymore. The lion's now eating the lamb, and so they needed a shepherd to take care of the flocks. And so the very first profession was uh, Abel and Cain, but Abel taking care of the flocks because they absolutely needed a shepherd. If we were to take all the shepherds away, if all the lambs and uh, sheep and rams and all that were left by themselves for an entire year, it wouldn't take a year, but it would wipe out, there wouldn't be a, there wouldn't be a sheep left after a year. If they were out in the wild like dogs or cats or anything else that was left out to itself to fend for itself, there would be no survival. The sheep need a shepherd. And so the Lord, he is the one who is our shepherd. And the good shepherd, as Jesus called himself, like the good parent, makes sure that every want, and that want is need in our life, every need in our life is taken care of. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew, the sixth chapter. This was one of my favorite chapters when I first got saved because it really uh, hit that spot in my heart that I needed. And that was the Lord being my shepherd, the Lord taking care of all my worries, all my anxieties, all of my needs. And it's in Matthew 6, starting in verse 25, where Jesus is telling his uh, people telling the crowd, telling the sheep, do not worry. And so when you look at that word worry, that need that's in your life, he says, therefore I tell you, do not worry. You don't need to be in need about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food? And the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Do you see the picture he's saying? He says, look out at the birds. They're flying around. They're happy. They're singing. They don't sow. They don't reap. They don't punch a time clock. But your heavenly Father is the one that feeds them, that makes sure that there's seed on the ground, that anywhere on planet Earth where these birds are, they are going to be taken care of. And he says, are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes. See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, just like the birds. They don't have to do it. God does it for them. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith. He's saying God created, you know, the little butterfly that goes out there. He just created it because it was pretty, because he wanted to see it. The lilies of the field, the roses that are out there, they've got a beauty and a splendor. And he says, even Solomon couldn't dress himself like one of these. God says, and that was just a very little thing. And if he's going to do that for the grass, if he's going to do that for the lilies, then he will take care of our needs. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. All right, here's the second idea. The pagans run after them. Why? They run after them because they don't have a shepherd. 
They don't believe that a shepherd exists, that God exists that's watching over them and taking care of them. They are all they got. You know what I'm saying? If they don't do it, nobody else is going to do it for them. They've got to look after number one. So they're always anxious, always uptight, always fretting about where everything's going to take place because they don't have a shepherd that's going to do it for them. That's why Jesus said, hey, the pagans run after all these things. The people out in the world do all these things. Are we doing the same thing that the people in the world are doing? And if we are, why are we doing it? We're doing it because our confidence and trust is not in the shepherd. Because if it was, we would be at peace because he said, his sheep will not be in want. They will not be in need. He will always take care of them. They have to fend for themselves. You know, the survival of the fittest uh, mentality. The idea of giving and helping others would be foreign to them because they need to hoard all the stuff for themselves. You know, you ever watch the movies or the end time uh, doomsday scenarios? We're all going to move up into the mountains and build a bunker and hoard everything so that we can survive. You know, for what? Uh, but anyhow... You know, the Lord is the one who takes care of all of our needs. And so people just run around being anxious and worried, stressed out, panicky. They're afraid because they're all that they are got. You know, it's interesting, as I was thinking about this, the rise of communism, the rise of socialism, the rise of all of these uh, dictator type of governments and how it's become so much more popular here in the United States. Do you know why? The reason is the less God is recognized and exalted, the greater these governments, because we all like sheep, we need a shepherd. And instead of looking to God, we're going to look to the government to take care of us from the cradle to get, uh, grave. Have you ever thought about that? And, you know, the people in Cuba, you know, how's that worked out for them? The people in China and the old Soviet Union, Russia, Venezuela. I mean, what government do you know, big government, that has the interest of the people at heart. Our founding fathers, they were afraid of big government because of King George, because of what they saw in Spain and France and all the other governments. There's never been a government. Read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. What government was out there that was taking care of the people? But when God is not First and foremost in your life, as God is diminished, either in the nation or in somebody's life, then they're going to look for a shepherd. They're going to look for big government or something else to take care of all their needs. Because that is the desire, is we as sheep, we're looking for someone else to provide for us. And when we're looking to anything else besides God, it's going to be bad news. It's never going to work out the way that we think it should. People want a guarantee of being taken care of. Well, God's guarantee was Philippians 4.19, where he said, My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. Let's say that together. And my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Amen? That's the one who is going to take care of our need. And nobody else can fill that spot. Now, God uses other people. God will use different situations. I mean, we're seeing it uh, happening right before our very eyes. It always happens that way. But ultimately, it's not the person, it's not the employer that's really supplying your needs, the source of that is God. He says, I will meet all of your needs according to his riches in glory. Amen? Yeah. So for those of you who uh, you know, are seeing all of this dramatic change, it's no coincidence that as the American uh, 
psyche, the American uh, demeanor has changed from in God we trust, focusing on God, and moving more to a bigger government, more socialism. How many of y'all are feeling the burn? Yeah, and if it's not going to be uh, Bernie, it's going to be someone down the road, and it's not going to feel very good. We have to trust in the Lord our God to supply all of our needs. Now let's look at letter B. The secret of contentment in Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 11. I like what Paul says there. There there is a secret. What is the secret that Paul was talking about? Well, let's read in verse 11. He says, uh, 4.11, For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content. There is a secret to being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Amen? Let's look at that uh, second verse there, flow, f- verse 13. Now, Paul's contentment, he said, was learned. Now, a secret, by definition, is something that not everybody knows about. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a secret. And I can tell you that even if you know the secret here, it's got to get down here into your heart before that secret is truly revealed because it's going to manifest itself in your life each and every day in practical circumstances. It uh, will become uh, natural. Now, Paul's contentment, he said, was what? It was learned. Learned. Something that is learned takes Practice. Would you agree with me? Takes exercise. My daughter, she, uh, Chrissy, she is the ballerina. You know, she runs around and, and does all that. Well, she'll do a performance and she'll do a three or four minute dance. But behind that three or four minute dance were hundreds of hours of practice, of repetition. You know, that new word that came out a few years ago, maybe in the last decade or so, muscle memory. The brain teaches the muscles how to do things that it normally didn't do. And then all of a sudden, as you watch it on the stage, I I won't perform it for you, obviously, because it wouldn't look natural and it wouldn't look pretty. But... When it's learned, when that muscle memory is learned and it's executed uh, flawlessly, do y'all like to watch the Olympics and the gymnasts and doing those exercise, unbelievable exercises uh, out there? Hundreds and hundreds of hours and it becomes natural. Well, the secret of being content is the same in the spiritual realm. God is giving us every day to exercise, to work those spiritual muscles so that in time it becomes learned and then it becomes natural to our way of life. When something happens in my life, the first thing I do, I used to hit the panic button. Now I turn to the Lord. I'm crying out to God. That should be the natural response when situations happen in our life. And so God will create those situations so that we will turn to him and then the good shepherd will come in and take care of our needs. Now let me tell you, first of all, what verse 13, the key to uh, contentment is found here in verse 13. Do we got that? Up there, Flo? Okay, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Uh, The King James says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So the key to contentment is found in verse 13, but let me tell you what it is not saying. Meals are not parachuted in to your doorstep every day. You know, it's not just dropped in. You're not going to wake up and find a brand new car in your driveway in the morning. 
It's not, God is not publisher's clearinghouse, you know, that's going to show up at your front door with a big fat check like Ed McMahon, you know, and just take care of all your needs. Everything's taken care of. You don't have to worry. What does it say? It says that I can do all things. So who is doing the doing? You is. Who's doing the doing? He says, I can. God isn't the one who is doing it. He's doing it through us. And that's a big difference. We're not doing it all by ourselves. God's not doing it all by himself. God could, but he has to do it and wants to do it through us. But let me, let me illustrate this. And I was thinking of the story. And if you want to look... Uh, instead of just telling you the story, in Luke chapter 5, Jesus, his first encounter, according to Luke's gospel, with the apostle Peter, uh, who was the fisherman at the time, and James and John, uh, I want you to see this and look at this uh, fresh in Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 1. It is the calling of the first disciples. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God. So he is preaching to the people around the lake. A big crowd is gathered around him. He saw the water's edge, two boats that were left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. They had fished all night. They're done. Now what are they doing? They're washing up. They're getting ready to retire their nets and go to sleep and start the next day. So they're washing their nets. He got into one of the boats that belonged to Simon and asked him, put out a little farther from shore. Then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking. Now, when most people get done preaching or speaking, they'll dismiss the crowd, They'll clean up, they'll go home. Not Jesus. He finished speaking, probably telling them not to worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll wear. Don't worry about your clothes. God's going to take care of it. All this high motivational stuff to get you really pumped up. You know, and Peter's probably been dragging all night. And so when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we have toiled all night and haven't caught anything. But at your word, I will let down the nets. He said, Lord, we fished ourselves out. We tried all night. We couldn't do it. And you know what? That was not by accident. They should have been able to catch a few things. They got these nets. They got the sea there. They couldn't catch anything. God might have been there all night, and as the fish were going to the nets, pushing them to the left, to the right, I mean, they just just won't get in the boat. They wouldn't get in the nets. And so they got skunked the whole night. And you're trying to provide for yourself, and if he didn't have any money at home, and he didn't have any fish to sell that day, he worked all day and he, or all night, couldn't get anything. You think he would be a little down? You think he would be a little depressed? He said, we've toiled all night, but we haven't caught a thing. But he said, but because you say so, Lord, I'll do it. And when he had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that the nets began to break. So he signaled their partners in the other boat to come and to help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Can you imagine? All of these boats, the fish are coming in till they're absolutely beginning to sink the boats. God, Jesus didn't just tell them, he showed them that he was their provider, that he could take care of their needs. And at the end of that, he said, now come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. 
And so the good shepherd is able to take care of our needs. He is able to take care of all that is going on in our lives. And I'm telling you, instead of being down and depressed, now they were fat and happy because they got all this fish in these boats. Don't you want to go to work and have something productive done? Don't you want to uh, get things accomplished and to build on what you are doing? Or do you just like spinning your wheels all the time? Well, I believe God kept them from catching fish that particular night because God had something to show them. You may be casting out your net right now, and you may not be bringing in anything right now, and that may be by design. That God is about to show you that you are going to be provided for because God God can provide for us. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's how life happens. That's how life happens in our life. You know, I've shared this story with uh, <clears throat> excuse me, our daughter Chrissy um, going to American Heritage and how my wife had prayed all summer before between her 8th and ninth grade year about getting in there. And did everything that she uh, possibly could to uh, get in there. Couldn't get in the front door. Couldn't get anybody to call her. Couldn't do anything. But God opened the door. And so she was able to start her freshman year talking about the reason she's going to uh, uh, med school is because she went through four years of American heritage for college prep. God had it all worked out. We couldn't do it in our own strength. We have to do our part. But God is the provider. God is the one who does all things. And so when you're working with God, he is going to make your life productive. He is going to show you that he is the good shepherd for your life. When I started my produce business back in the early 90s, I was actually it started out as an herb business, uh, a spinoff from my dad's farm. And uh, I was selling out of the back of our family car, which uh, April wasn't too happy about. And uh, the business was starting to take off and I needed a bigger vehicle. And I remember, I literally remember praying that I needed a, uh, a small truck, but it needed to have an extended uh, bed, and I wanted a camper on it. And so I'd been praying for this for a while, and then all of a sudden, after church one Sunday, a guy came up to me, and he said, the Lord, this is what he said, he said, the Lord spoke to me today, and he said, he wants me to give you his truck. I thought, you got to be kidding me. And so we go out, and I look at, it was an S10 extended bed with a, with a uh, camper on it, and that was the vehicle I had been praying for. That's exactly what I had in my mind's eye, what God was going to provide for us. How does that happen? It's because the Lord is our shepherd. He is our provider. When we were looking for a church, and I've told that story, when we showed up here, had no intention of being here, but when we showed up here, we knew this was the place. Who was providing? God was providing. He is the shepherd. He will lead us as we begin to pray for a church building of our own. How's it going to work? The same way. God is going to lead us. There is a place that's already set out, and in his time, he will provide. We don't have to be anxious. We don't have to be worried about where our food's going to come from, where our clothes are going to come from, because it's God himself who provides for us, who takes care of our needs. That's why he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's the secret of being content. Now let's look at the second point, and it's the cares that creep up in our lives. I believe that 90% of the worries and the cares and the burdens that we carry because we are not trusting in the shepherd. This is the subtle trap for the Christians, and it can be deadly. If we fall into the same trap that the world falls into, 
where Jesus said, the pagans, they're running after all these things. They're not looking to the shepherd. They're trying to do it themselves in their own strength, in their own power. That's what happens. We start wandering from the field that God has placed for us, from the pastures that God has given to us. I want to read just... uh, one of the stories out of uh, the shepherd's 23rd Psalm that I really liked. It was on uh, page 30, and he talked about one of his wayward sheep. And he said, uh, you know, in spite of having such a master and owner, talking about the Lord, the fact remained that some Christians are still not content. They're still not happy with his control. They are somewhat dissatisfied, always feeling somehow that the grass beyond the fence must be a little greener on the other side. You know what I'm talking about? These are the carnal Christians, one might even call them fence crawlers or half Christians who want the best of both worlds. And he says, I once owned a you who conducted exactly typified this sort of person. She was one of the most attractive sheep that ever belonged to me. Her body was beautifully proportioned. She had strong constitution and an excellent coat of wool. Her head was clean, alert, well set with bright eyes. She bore sturdy lambs that matured rapidly. I mean, this one was the ideal sheep, one of the best sheep that this guy had ever owned. But in spite of all these attractive attributes, there was still one pronounced fault. She was restless. She was discontent. She was a fence crawler. So much so that I called her Miss Gadabout. I don't know exactly what that meant, but that's what he called her. And this one you produced more problems for me than almost all the rest of the flock combined. He was always chasing and running after this one, getting him back into the pasture. No matter what field or pasture the sheep were in, she would search all along the fence or shoreline. We lived by the sea, looking for a loophole she could crawl through and start to feed on the other side. It was not that she lacked pasturage. My fields were my joy and delight. No sheep in the district had better grazing. Is there any better grazing than the pasture of the Lord that he's provided for us. There cannot be any better pastures. Well, Ms. Gadabout, it was ingrained habit. She was simply never content with the things as they were. Often when she was forced her way through some spot in the fence or found a way around the end of the wire as low tide on the beaches, she would end up feeding on bare, brown, burned up pasturage of the most inferior sort. Do you get that picture? Here we are, we're getting fed by God's word. We're getting encouraged. And then we go out into the world or we're going to see junk on TV that isn't edible, that isn't edifying to the soul. And we start feeding on that and we're listening to people at work with the gossip and everything else. And we're just eating nasty trash for our soul day in and day out and not getting our soul and our spirit fed. Well, that's the parallel there. Now it would have been bad enough if she was the only one who did this. It was sufficient problem to find her and bring her back. But to further the point was that she taught her lambs the same tricks. They simply followed her example and soon were as skilled at escaping as their mother. Do you get that? It's a learned trait. And so now all of them and her uh, lambs are discontent. Even worse, however, was the example she set for the other sheep. In short time, she began to learn, she began to lead others through the same holes and over the same dangerous paths down by the sea. After putting up with her perverseness for a summer, I finally came to the conclusion that to save the rest of the flock, from becoming unsettled, she would have to go. 
So I could not allow one obstinate discontent you to ruin the whole ranch operation. It was a difficult decision for I loved her in the same way I loved the rest. Her strength and her beauty and her alertness were a delight to the eye. But one morning I took the killing knife in hand and butchered her. Her career as fence crawling was cut short. Now that sounds pretty intense. That sounds, um, you know, pretty dramatic. It was the only solution to the dilemma. She was a sheep who, in spite of all that I had done for her to give her the very best care, still wanted something else. She was not like the one who said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. It is a solemn warning to the carnal Christian, backslider, the half-Christian, the one who wants the best of both worlds. Sometimes in short order, they can be cut down. Don't want for that which God has not given you, the cares of this world. Now consider, consider the story of Adam and Eve. They were given the very best. They lacked for absolutely nothing. Yet, they crawled over the fence to where God commanded them not to, and that caused the downfall of mankind. You couldn't have a better planet. You couldn't have a better pasture than what God provided for them. Yet, They were not satisfied. They were given paradise. They were given perfection, body, soul, and spirit. They were not in any want. They lacked nothing, but they were tempted with something far more. They became fence crawlers. Hey, listen, um, let me share a quick story with you. Uh, Do you know where the history of advertising began here in America? See, there was a problem in America back in the 1880s, 1890s, back then. Most people, and there was about 80% of the population lived in rural areas. Most people in America didn't need anything. They really didn't. They had their house. They had chickens. They had milking cows. They had a vegetable garden. You know, they made uh, most of their furniture. Once a year, they'd go to the general store and uh, get fabric for clothes, get some uh, sewing needles and thread and, you know, those type of things. But basically, they had everything that they needed and they were self-sufficient. And so a little book, it was called Sears and Roebuck Catalog, came to all the uh, cities. And all of a sudden, somebody saw, wow, here's a Singer sewing machine. And some lady got a Singer sewing machine. And of course, everybody in town had to see the Singer sewing machine and how great this sewing machine worked. Guess what? Next fall, everybody had a Singer sewing machine. You know, and there were Winchester rifles that were more accurate and better. And of course, all the guys needed a rifle. And all the things in the book, all of a sudden... These things became not wants, they became needs, and they kept growing. I remember as a kid, you know, when my best friend, Warren Foley, got a new bike, and my other friends, I told my parents, everybody on the block has a new bike except me. I need a new bike. You know what I'm talking about? And so with all the advertising that has grown and spawned, all of a sudden, what are they trying to teach you? in these commercials, in these advertisements, that you need what they have and that you need to go buy what they have. In 2012, when we uh, uh, started full time here, I I sold my uh, truck, commercial truck, and uh, we gave our uh, minivan that we had had for over 10 years to to my son and his wife because they needed a family car. And uh, by the way, that that car uh, is still working. It's up in uh, St. Louis. And uh, that car is going to get almost 200,000 miles. I mean, the outside looks nice. I mean, but with our four kids and then with uh, their two kids, our two grandkids, they've trashed the inside of that thing. But it still runs and it hums down the road. So anyhow, uh, we got my wife, a brand, her first brand new car, a Honda SRV. And so drove it off the lot. And um, two years later, two years later, I get a call 
uh, from Rick Case. He, not, not Rick Case, but you know, one of his uh, uh, salesmen. And uh, he wants me to buy another car. To trade, this car hadn't even lost its new car smell yet. And he's telling me that if we trade in this car, we can get a brand new 2015 and our po uh, payments are gonna be less than our 2012. What's he trying to do? You need a new car. And I'm thinking to myself, no, I do not. We're gonna drive that thing till it turns to dust. I mean, we're gonna get the whole life out of that car. But that's the idea. They want to get in your heart that you need something that the Lord has not provided for you, that the Lord has not wanted to give you and to get us to crawl over the fence. We need to watch out for that. And I'm going to give you one of the classic stories from Scripture about a, f a fence crawler. And his name was King David. And that story is found in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And I'm going to read a couple of verses here. Let me just start in verse 1 of 2 Samuel chapter 11. And it says, In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. But David stayed in Jerusalem. See how that started out? In the springtime, when the kings go off to war. That's what it says. David was a king. He did not go off to war. He was just kind of setting back. He was just kind of taking it easy. He was the most successful king they had ever had. And then in verse 2, it says, One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around the roof of his palace. So he must have taken a long afternoon nap. It's not quite dark yet because he's there on the roof and he's looking over the roof, just kind of relaxing, enjoying himself. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. I mean, this is live pornography here. He's, he's a peeping Tom. He's, he's seeing this beautiful woman and he gets one of his messengers and says, hey, find out about her for me. So they go and they come back and they say, um, the man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? He knew Uriah personally. Uriah the Hittite was one of his 30 mighty men. He had a relationship with him. They'd been into battle together. And so he finds out, oh, well, she's a married woman. She's off the market, not for David. And so then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. She had purified herself from her uncleanliness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. And so now it's getting really bad. He's already crawled over the fence. He's already done something that he knew he wasn't supposed to do. Now he's got to cover it up. So he has Uriah the Hittite killed in battle. And after two and a half years, they had a baby. Uh, looked like everything was going well. But in chapter 12, God sends a prophet by the name of Nathan. The Lord sent Nathan to David. And when he had come to him, he tells him this story. There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except the little ewe lamb that he had bought. Now David, of course, was the shepherd, and he could identify with a man with a little sheep, a little ewe lamb. He raised the lamb... He raised it and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup. Yuck, can you imagine drinking from his cup? Hey, we were at a family's house one time and after dinner, they put the plates on the ground and the dogs came and licked it up and we were like, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> did the dishwasher break? You know, that type of thing. And uh, so this uh, lamb drinks from the cup. 
and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking his own sheep or cattle to prepare for a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely uh, as the Lord lives, that man who has done this deserves to die. He, he was seething. He was shaking. Now remember, be careful when you uh, pass judgment on somebody else because you may be judging yourself. And then Nathan hits him right between the eyes. He said, you are the man. This is what the Lord of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the whole house of Israel and Judah. And I love this next part. And if all of that had not been too little, I would have given you even more. Can you imagine? God's provisions for our needs are abundant. It's above and beyond all that we could ask or think. But the enemy is trying to get us to look over into the other pastures. David was the most successful king that Israel ever had. He wiped out Goliath. He was able to deal with King Saul. He was able to deal with all of his enemies. And he got tripped up with what? The cares of this world, looking on the other side of the fence that God said was off limits for him. The church, we need to watch out for the cares of this world, for the things that we think that we need, because the things that we think we need, we don't really need. If we have him and walk with him, we are in need of nothing. I shall not want. I shall not be in need because Jesus is all I need. He is my good shepherd. Amen? Amen. David is a man after God's own heart, yet if our heart goes astray, forsaking our first love, forsaking our heavenly father, then sin will be crouching at our door, desiring to have us. Don't let the cares of this world Become our masters. They want the wants of your flesh, rule your decision making, cause you to become restless, discontent, a fence crawler. We must stay close to the good shepherd. Amen? All right, let's look at the last point. And he finishes off Matthew chapter 6 with this verse. And he says that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, all these want, all these needs shall be added to you as well. Don't worry about that. Seek first the kingdom of God. Again, Paul said, I have learned the secret of being content. Does everything have to go well for us to be content? No, sometimes the greatest trials are the greatest places of God's peace and his presence. You know, I don't think I told Joy this, but after the first week she was in the hospital, I went and visited her. There was this incredible presence of God on her. As I was talking to her, I was getting blessed. There was something that was going on there where the peace of God that passes all understanding. She was having one of the worst weeks in her life, but I don't know if she felt it, but I could feel the presence of God all over her. And as I was leaving, I mean, I literally felt renewed, felt encouraged just by the presence of God. You may be going through a hard time, but God may be drawing us deeper because if everything's taken care of, we won't go deeper with him. But if we go deeper and we find the joy, if we find the peace that passes understanding, it's something that is tangible, is what it says in Isaiah 53, 7. As a sheep 
before her shepherd, uh, as a sheep before her shears, is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Talking about the Lord. In the midst of being sheared, in the midst of being beaten, in the midst of being crucified, as the sheep before her shears is silent, he was content. He did not open his mouth. He did not rebel. He did not push away. Now, we have actually a sheep dog. Uh, his name's Bubba. He's a bearded collie. And he literally, if you want a visual picture, have you ever seen the shaggy DA, the old thing? I mean, literally, his hair grows out. You can't even see his eyes. I mean, when it's all over there, and uh, his hair, it's bushy. And when we first got him, we still had the four kids, so uh, we're on a real tight budget. So uh, April bought some clippers, and she and uh, Candy, they would shear Bubba uh, when he got too full. And I mean... It was pretty rough. I mean, sometimes you could see the, the skin was showing and it was splotchy and everything else. And I'd take him out running. I'd call him, I'd change his name for two weeks to chemo, you know, because uh, he just looked uh, so horrible. And uh, I mean, he didn't even look like the same dog. Uh, but you know, that whole idea as the sheep before shears is silent. And actually, I kind of learned that personally last month. Last month I went in to get a haircut and uh, this girl that was cutting my hair, she was a young, she couldn't be any older than Chrissy. And uh, I said, how long have you been cutting hair? And she said, oh, I think about a year. I said, okay, just got out of cosmetology school. And so she's cutting away at my hair. Okay, and she's going along. I have never had anybody who's ever cut my hair and I've had my hair cut hundreds of times who said, she looked at it and she said, I don't know what to do. <laughs> that was not inspiring confidence inside of me. Literally, she said four times, and what she did, she I don't know what to do, and then she'd start cutting some more. <laughs> And my hair, it's, it's very straight, and it, and it sticks out. And so she'd say it again, and she kept cutting more. You know, and she was getting flustered, and she was getting nervous. And uh, so now I'm trying to comfort her. <laughs> uh, literally, she's butchering my hair, and I'm telling her, I'm saying, look, you know, don't worry about it. Um, you know, you just put a little spray and the uh, gel and stuff like that. And, you know, I was going to tell her the difference between a, uh, you know, a $15 haircut, which I was getting, and the $100 haircut that you get at the fancy salons. The difference is about two weeks, you know, and two weeks, it'll kind of, well, in this case, it's four weeks and counting. Um, because when she got done, she started with a hairspray. That didn't work. Then she got the uh, gel, you know. I think she needed some, uh, you know, uh, that wet cement stuff uh, to try and get it down. And I mean, literally, you know, normally if you see me, I usually, uh, you know, and, and during the week, I don't put any gel or anything in my hair. I just let it go out. And so during the week, my hair's out like this. <laughs> and if my hair was red, I'd look like Bozo the Clown during the week, you know, walking around there. And so, um, I mean, I'm putting all kinds of spray and gel. Uh, I got, my hair today is like pa plaster of Paris. I mean, I got everything, the hair won't move and it still won't lay down. I mean, but th this lady was just, I forgot how, what I was talking about, but this lady <laughs> was cutting my hair. And listen, I'm not gonna tell her name, but if you have anybody that you really don't like, send them to me, I'll set them up. <laughs> Especially you ladies, if you got a lady at work, you know, they're really particular about their hair. <laughs> you know, send them over there. But anyhow, um, you know, we get so uptight about all the, you know, the little things. But the thing is, it's the Lord who is our shepherd. He takes care of all of our needs. And even Jesus was on the cross. He said it was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross, scorning a shame. It was the joy, it was the contentment of his father that was taking care of him. And the point is that we all have wants. We all have needs in our life. Jesus said so himself. He says, your heavenly father knows that you need him. Oh, babe, we're gonna get ready and close here. Your heavenly father knows that you need him 
But don't crawl over the fence to try and get them. Instead, what should we do? We should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and see what God will do in your life. See how God will open the doors. I know when I'm trying to open the doors in my own strength, in my own flesh, it always falls apart. It never works out right. But you know what? When we're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he makes it all work. He's the one who takes care of it. We don't have to crawl over the fence to get there. He will order each day of your life. Your heavenly father uh, first needs to be our shelter and our refuge. He is our friend and he is our companion. To be the good shepherd and uh, be where he leads us and takes us. And so uh, we don't, he's not going to lead us over to the brown pastures, is he? He's going to lead us to the green pastures. He's going to lead us to the place that's going to satisfy our soul. Amen? Let's go ahead and stand together. And maybe you're in a season right now where there's a lot of need in your life. And you have been toiling all night like Peter was. And you just don't seem to be getting the catch that you need. Whatever it may be, God may be drawing you deeper to that place where he is all you need. He is your provider. He is your protector. Amen. If you need prayer, and especially if the Lord you know in your heart is not your shepherd right now, and you want to make him your shepherd, you want to make him the Lord of your life, today is the day of salvation. Whatever may be happening in your life right now and you need prayer, I'm going to ask you to come forward and I want to be able to pray for you. And the good shepherd, believe me, the good shepherd is the one who will answer your prayers, not me, but he will. Amen. If you need prayer, come forward.